Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you guys all for coming. Uh, I still can't believe that this book ever actually finished. It took such a long time. I posted the original contract online the other day, and it was due September 2016. So I missed that by a couple of years. And as Eric knows, he got a, you know, he ordered it on Amazon early and then got a message that it was canceled. And at one point, the book was canceled by my publisher. And then in my favorite <laughs> strange moment, uh, to all those Seinfeld fans out there, my editor ended up pulling a George Costanza and just sort of, when he qu quits on Friday and comes back in on Monday, she ended up contacting me after the New Year and saying, what's the status of the book? And I thought, well, you canceled it. But anyway, it's been a long journey. It also totally did not expect, turn out like I had expected, um, which I'm sure I'll talk about a bit. And uh, yeah, I, I normally, I think a lot of you guys know me and I'm a pretty casual, informal person. And I think m m our time is best set for me answering questions more so than anything. But I'll talk a little bit about how I got into the book and what the experience has been like a bit. Um, first though, well, I wanna just thank you again for coming. This, I, I, it still is surreal to me. Like I see the cover of the book and I think, oh, I'd like to read that book. Um, and then I remember I wrote it. Um, and then I also just really wanna thank my wife, Katie, um, who, is, who the book is dedicated to. I dedicated the first book to her and thought like, well, next will be someone else. But th she really deserves so much credit for this and financially supporting me throughout a lot of the extra years of writing the book and being so supportive and all, and helping me make decisions that I thought were based on the best book as opposed to just finishing the book. Um, so, go back in time five years, which is how long it, I guess it took me, to uh, my first book, Console Wars. And for me, that was a life-changing experience. Prior to that, I had been a commodities broker selling coffee, sugar, and soybeans by day. And, uh, and then writing with Jonah, my screenwriting partner over there, by night and us struggling for several years to uh, do that, and so Council Wars was a really big break, and it was the first time that anyone outside of my, immediately fam my immediate family or Jonah read my stuff, and, uh, and I remember one of the th cool things early on was that Popular Mechanics was gonna do an article about me, and they were gonna do a photo shoot, and this was like such a big deal in the Harris household that my dad, who's over there, he uh, came to the photo shoot, and uh, everyone was really excited, and. Um, and then coincidentally or fortuitously, the magazine came out on Mother's Day in 2014. And uh, I, we were having brunch in the city and I hustled, over to, um, I hustled over to the bodega to pick up a copy of the magazine. And uh, before I even got to the article about me in this great moment, I, the, I noticed that on the cover there was a, a kid wearing a virtual reality headset whose name was Palmer Lucky and he had founded a company called Oculus. And I was way more interested in his story than in my story. And I thought that was a good sign. Um, and then a couple months later, I was introduced to him and uh, really fell in love with, with his, his, hearing about his experiences and starting this company, Oculus, and hearing about their quest to resurrect virtual reality. Um, I think a lot, for a lot of us, we grew up in the 80s and 90s and remember that VR was the next big thing. And whether that came in the form of Nintendo's Virtual Boy or um, you know, Dactyl Nightmares at the mall. Um, I, I think that if you had pulled me aside and said like, hey kid, what do you think the future is? I would have said virtual reality. And that did not come to pass uh, for a lot of interesting reasons. Um, and then a few years ago, five years ago or so, it sounded like that was again gonna be the case and it still remains to be seen how successful virtual reality will be. Um, but it's still a hell of a startup story, and, uh, and I'm still bullish on the technology. And uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? What about the most handsome question that you're gonna ask? Oh, right, yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, actually, Blake, I, I do have a question for you. We, I think we, oh, thank you. Uh, Blake, actually, thanks for talking about your book. And I just, we, you and I talked about this really briefly a few years ago, I think, when you were writing about investigating this and researching VR. And I, I wanted to know when you thought this would go really mainstream and become part of the everyday consciousness for people and becomes like a mass commodity, basically, where virtual reality is really accessible to people. Uh, and you gave me an example of when you're talking to your parents 
and you feel like you're, you're in dis- different geographic locations and you feel like you're in the same place, that's when it really would, that when right. we cross that, that threshold, that's when we really feel like VR uh, or AR is accessible to everyone. Have your views on that changed? Like, when do you think that threshold is now? now that well, it's been a couple of years since you gave that answer, so. Did I, did I specify a prediction? No, <laughs> no, you didn't give me a date. Right, yes. You didn't give me a date. <laughs> I thought it, I might have said by now. Like 2019. Was, yeah, it was like 2012, January 2012. That's when you told me. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. No, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the more interesting elements of reporting on the book is that, um, you know, you have this, this small company that's mostly made up of true believers at Oculus, and they, and, and even within that group of four people originally, or then 20 or 50 or whatever, um, now it's up to over 1,000. Uh, Facebook, Facebook acquired Oculus in uh, 2014 for $3 billion. And, you know, even amongst that group, you, I feel like there was two different thoughts about how the trajectory of virtual reality could go in the best case scenario. And um, it was basically a divide between um, a comparison to the smartphone and how ubiquitous that became and how quickly we went from BlackBerry and iPhones to it being a part of everyday life or to um, a different technological revolution, more of like the PC revolution in the late 70s. Um, and I think that, you know, the company that most represents that is often Apple, and they were super successful and were a beloved company with a mercurial, charismatic founder, not unlike Palmer Lucky. But um, even in that case, and we think about them as a success, I, you know, our family didn't own a personal computer until 15 years later. So even though it started to enter the national consciousness in the late 70s, it still didn't really become mainstream until 15 years later. I don't think it will take 15 years if it even happens with VR and with AR. Um, but I am a little bit surprised by, by how slow it has gone, particularly in, in the social aspect. You know, Oculus started off as very explicitly a gaming company. Their tagline was step into the game, and that was what they were promising. That's why Palmer Lucky was building this headset to be able to have more fun playing games. Um, and then when they were acquired, it was a really big surprise because you thought if they were going to be acquired, it would be, be by Sony or Microsoft or maybe even Nintendo, but it was Facebook. And, it sounded really odd, and then you kind of thought about it, and you thought about, for people who had read Ready Player One, or maybe even now seen it, like, okay, there's a whole ecosystem here, and uh, th- they can be the big evil corporation. No, they can, um, you know, really facilitate the social interactions, but so far, the social side of it has been pretty slow, much slower than I would have expected, um, and so I do think that, that is what is probably going to push it along the most. Um, I would note, however, that uh, Facebook and Oculus are coming out with a new headset called Oculus Quest in a couple of months that, that is probably going to be the best and most affordable headset ever. Um, and that'll be, I'm, I'm hoping that that is successful. Um, you know, one of the, I think that v, VR definitely, if nothing else, captured the fascination of a lot of people over these past few years, whether it's, you know, appearing on Big Bang Theory in a little cameo or just that, the fact that we talk about it and it's no longer a punchline like flying cars. Um, but, but one of the real big problems was that the, the headset that Oculus was selling that would you know, appear on Big Bang Theory and see like, oh, it's only this $300 thing, it's pretty cool, it's at least worth it just for a fun gift, is you needed a computer that cost about $1,500 or a, you know, a high performance computer. And so that was a real problem, um, not only because that's an additional $1,500, but also because the headset would then need to be tethered to the computer, uh, which made for not always an ideal experience. And so, and then on the flip side of that, there was also a very low-end experience that uh, Oculus partnered with Samsung to deliver the Gear VR, which you kind of snapped your phone into. And um, that was cool and accessible, but also sort of exactly um, w- what a lot of people didn't want VR to be, a cool gimmicky thing that wouldn't, you know, really, br- ha- you know, it might initially get some engagement, but there wasn't much retention. Um, and so I think that what's really exciting about the new headset coming out with Oculus Quest is that it's sort of the best of both worlds. It's an untethered experience that has what's called six degrees of freedom, so you can move and look all around. And, uh, and it should be, you know, it's going to be your three or $400. Um, and then, but then there's also this aspect that it's made by Facebook. And I think there's a lot of people who are skeptical of Facebook these days. And after my experiences reporting this book, I'm skeptical of Facebook these days. But from, at least from a technological standpoint, I'm pretty psyched about the Quest headset. Hey. Uh, should I put the mic or 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, take off my jacket. Hi, Luke. Okay. Uh, you mentioned before that the book was canceled for a little while, and now we're here three, uh, almost three years later. How much, has, how much did your story change in that time from uh, that date in September 2016 to now February 2019? How much has the story of VR and uh, VR changed? Um, the story of VR, I feel like, changes weekly, um, and it oscillates in this bipolar way between you know, people think, feeling like now it's finally going to happen and oh my god, we're in this trough of disillusionment and it's never going to work and VR's dead and it was just this gimmicky thing. But in terms of my book, um, it really changed a lot and that also contributed, I think, partly to why it was cancelled. So, um, you know, I, I, the first 400 pages of this 500 page book are, to me, it's the ultimate startup experience in the same way that Console Wars was sort of um, ultimately a book about marketing. This, to me, is a book about entrepreneurship and you have this great startup story and you see so much of what it takes to be successful, how it's not just an idea, how it's not just one person, how it's so much of it is timing. Um, and then Oculus sells to Facebook and then the story changed a great deal um, if for no other reason that, that the main character in the book is no longer with the company and the way that that happened was very unexpected. Um, and some of you might be familiar with that because it was in the news, but Basically, in September of 2016, this was about seven weeks before the presidential election, there was an article in the Daily Beast that came out, um, and the headline was, Facebook billionaire secretly funding Trump's meme machine. Um, and the insinuation was that every terrible meme that you'd seen online, anything with concentration camps or misogynistic um, attitudes and racism that this guy Palmer Lucky was responsible for that running some sort of troll factory and you know that was very that point was very implicitly and at times explicitly made in the article and then within five minutes it was very explicitly made by a tech influencer and then by the next day that became almost gospel that because people were reading about it it had to be true um, and so you know getting to the truth of that was a big part of my experience and took me to a lot of places I didn't expect to be, um, including a lot of time spent on the Donald, the Donald Trump subreddit, um, which was not my favorite place to hang out. But, um, but you know, I felt I had to get the story that nobody else seemed interested in getting. Um, and then at the same time, there was always the sense that it would sort of blow over. Um, after that news came out, um, Palmer was put on suspension or exiled from the office and not allowed to communicate with his colleagues and explain what had happened uh, as an internal investigation was launched. And uh, then after the investigation concluded that there was, you know, he had followed proper protocols and there was no issue, um, he was allowed back into the office for a day. Then there was a trial um, that o unrelated that Oculus was being sued for several billion dollars by an early potential partner. Um, and then at the end of that trial, before there was even a verdict, uh, he was told that he needed to clean out his office. And then a few days later, he was fired. And, uh, and there, there's definitely uh, a political element to all of this. And, and for me, it was, uh, it, was, it was personally and professionally challenging because I have very different politics than Palmer. Um, but at the same time, I felt that he had gotten a very raw deal um, in the media and also at Facebook. Um, and so, researching what actually happened, what, you know, and, and basically swerving the book in a direction that addressed those concerns and talked more about politics and more of the echo chamber that exists at Silicon Valley and then particularly at Facebook um, really changed the book. And, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad that it did because, um, it, you know, I think that an important question that anyone who's interested in this should ask, um, you know, even if you, it's like if you like this Quest headset or, or just thinking about the future of VR, is, is what role is Facebook or a company like Facebook going to play? And it's very, you know, most journalists doing their jobs will focus on short-term um, newsworthy events. Um, and, and, you know, people are very reactive and that's a lot of times what catches um, fire online. But, you know, if we look back at the impact that the internet has had on our lives, and I feel like this has become a much bigger conversation after the presidential election and unintended consequences and all of these things, I think um, it's really important to see how Facebook deals with their own reality um, and 
and, and, and think about that in terms of the kind of ecosystem and quote unquote metaverse that they're trying to create. Because um, you know, one of the things I found most disappointing was that Facebook is, is so much a company founded on an ethos of openness and transparency and Mark Zuckerberg appears um, you know, at town hall meetings every week and seemingly answers every question. And I think that for the most part, he's pretty sincere and pretty open but this was a situation to me where push came to shove and Facebook abandoned its principles and acted in, I think, very unethical ways that I don't know. I mean, I don't necessarily want to spoil the book too much for anyone who's looking to find out that way. But um, I was just very disappointed to see how they handled things. And then in following that experience, came to believe that that was not the first time that stuff like this happened there. Um, and, you know, as we all know, it's sort of easy to have idealistic principles when they're not pressured. Um, but when push comes to shove, you really learn a lot about a company or about a person. Yes, young man over there. Oh, wait. I want to answer the rest of it. Sorry. Okay, go, no, go Is that ahead. okay, Alex? Yeah. So um, one thing I want to say in terms of the book being canceled, I bear a huge amount of responsibility for that because I was so late with the book. Um, though my thought was always like, holy shit, this is a great story and I'm getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and so this is worth it. And hey, publisher, you already paid me my advance. So like, this is costing you nothing. You may as well take the free work. But anyway, um, I remember like a, a month before the book was canceled, my ed I had a meeting with my editor and she said, she mentioned how early on in the process we had talked about, um, one thing we connected over was that every good story has a hero. Um, and, and who was the hero in this book? And uh, I felt like I had answered this question to her years ago and said that it was Oculus and Palmer and not necessarily that they're always the good guy, but they're sort of our central protagonist and point of view. And so I said, you know, Oculus, Palmer. And she said, yeah, but, but he's a Trump supporter. And I just remember thinking like, well, okay, like you should work at Facebook because that's how they feel over there. Um, and, and, and again, I, you know, I'm most certainly not a Trump supporter and, and I've vocally, yeah, voiced that a lot of times. But um, I just couldn't believe that that was her thinking. Also, even just from um, like a pure capitalistic standpoint, I figured that she would think like, oh, well, there's a, you know, Trump people buy books, or we could figure out a way that he starts off as a hero and turns into a villain because he's a Trump supporter. But um, I, that just always really stuck with me. And um, then you know, I, I don't think that was a total coincidence that a month later, they canceled the book. Not to say that that was the reason, but you know, it, it made them lose confidence in the book. How can you sell a book about a Trump supporter? Um, and then fortunately for me, um, uh, Facebook became a better, sexier villain than a Trump supporter. Um, and so I was the beneficiary of their data breaches. Anyway, young man. Sorry, thank you. For no, that was letting. a good transition to my question. Yes. So, uh, your first book and your second book are both framed as the history of a technology, right? Like Sega versus Nintendo and now Oculus. But both times it was constructed around a hero's journey or like an underdog story, right? That ended up being the narrative, not necessarily the story of the company. Right. And I'm just curious if that is a result of your writing style or your research and talking to those individuals that presented themselves as a story. How did you end up framing the book that way? Said. Oh, that's a really good question. And because it's something that with console wars, I, I was not really consciously thinking about that much. Um, and, and I've thought about a great deal with this book for part of the reasons I was just discussing with how people will perceive certain characters based on things that seem unrelated to the book. Um, and, and just also the way that the story was reported with Palmer Lucky was so appalling to me that I, as a journalist, I wanted to do a better job and do a responsible job. And um, I, you know, I think there's a bunch of different ways to answer your question. One is that Somewhere along the way of writing console wars, I decided that what I, the, you know, that whenever I write anything, whether it's um, you know an oral history for how did this get made podcast or something the the oral history of the league for so I guess I do a lot of oral history so, uh, oral history of the league for ESPN or anything like that, I always want to write it with my grandmother in mind, it, meaning that. I want to write in a way that she would find fascinating, even though she doesn't care about Sega Nintendo, she doesn't care about consoles, she doesn't care about technology. And so to make the stories about people. Um, I also feel like in a lot of cases that's, uh, um, I mean, it's a more exciting way to tell a story, but I also feel like it's a more honest way because you know, with, with any of these stories, there's so many employees at the company and there's so many people on the outside with a front row seat that you could 
like opinion and perspective play such a big role in this and to try to write something as if from the voice of God just feels like an impossible and almost irresponsible at times task. I think that it's important to, uh, or that's not important, I, th I prefer to get it from someone's perspective, um, though I know that other people might have different stylistic preferences. Um, and then also I just, another thing, you know, your question reminds me a lot of how I was feeling at the beginning of the book when, when I initially sold the book, I, I didn't really know what the book was going to be. Um, I remember um, originally I was planning to write a different book about uh, the first three Americans to open a hotel in Tahiti. And, uh, and this editor said that it was interesting, but she wanted to, she thought I should write another tech book because Council Wars was a tech book and, and she, that was probably a, a wise move. And I told her I had been probing around virtual reality and Oculus, but that I thought the story was gonna take me long, you know, five years to write. So I guess she should have listened to me <laughs> then. Um, and then, and then um, I ended up meeting with her for a couple of hours and talking about the story. And instead of the 60 page book proposal I had spent months and months working on, I, you know, just talking about this led to them purchasing the book. Um, and again, there was a red flag in retrospect where right before uh, I signed the deal, she said to me, uh, hey, in addition to, to virtual reality, you should also do nanotechnology and robotics. And I was like, well, what do you mean, like, do them? Like, <laughs> like, like Alex Turanian said, I tell character-driven stories. Like, if anyone is looking into that, that and that's part of the narrative, sure, let's, let's explore that. But, like, what do you mean? Um, so I guess the, her and I were not always on the same page, and um, it ended up that there was a different editor by the end of the book. Um, but I... I like early on, I, I knew that I was fascinated by Oculus. I also did not know how much access I'd be able to get and, and to tell the kinds of stories that I want, the kinds that you're describing, uh, where you feel like you're, you're in the room with these people, like you're on their shoulders, in their head. You know, I really feel like I need that access because I don't want to fictionalize or presume what they're thinking. Um, and so I didn't know if I'd get that access and I was looking around at a bunch of different VR companies and you know, I'm, every day I'm reading these VR-based websites, um, and, and there's new companies popping up that are, you know, the one that's the next, the next Oculus, the next big thing, the next, they're all doing things that sound really cool, but you don't know if they're actually going to deliver. They all have long timetables. I haven't been able to try it for myself, and so initially I was, you know, I had like a whole list of, oh, here's all the companies that I want to swerve to in the story, and, you know, it was going to feel more like a series of vignettes, um, though I would try to structure in some way. And then at some point, um, I was starting to think, you know, that, that, that what I really liked about Council Wars was that it felt like a time capsule. It was a story about this period and told the story of Sega and Nintendo and, and the evolution of consoles from the perspective of um, one company and, and a few different people. And, um, and, and, that that was a, and through that sort of process, you also meet other companies along the way and, and all sorts of other characters and potential opportunities. And so um, I was trying to think like, wh what is the version of this book that would be relevant to read 10 years from now? Um, the one that doesn't fall, you know, seem to rely so much on hype. And, and again, I come back to it being a very character driven human story. And I was, I remember thinking a lot about Mad Men and how if you were gonna make a documentary or tell a story about advertising in the 1960s, you could meet with 12 different firms and find all these different characters and try to mix it all together or not, or you can tell it through one company and a few protagonists and get to all those other things because they're likely going to intersect with them. Oh yeah, and I got the Mad Men quote at the front of the book. That was like, the, yeah, the quote at the front of the book was uh, Peggy Olson saying to Don that he never says thank you and he says that's what the money is for. Um, and that felt so much, that, that line came to mind so many times after I finished my conversations with a lot of these people and felt like it embodied a lot of the Silicon Valley mentality, um, where as long as there was a transactional aspect to the relationship, then it was fine to really brush off a lot of the human aspects to the relationship. Um, and then the other one that I always, the other analogy for Silicon Valley that I thought of a lot was, uh, have you guys seen The Dark Knight, the, the second Batman movie with Heath Ledger? And it starts off with Heath Ledger and these, or I guess these clowns robbing a bank and there's four or five of them. And then after each step of the process, the guy turns around and shoots the other one. And then that guy, for some reason, doesn't think that he's gonna get shot. And I just felt like that was how uh, 
Silicon Valley operated, speci specifically with the myth making and the narrative, um, which I felt like was the case after uh, Palmer left the company and there was, um, it felt like very active measures to rewrite the narrative. And I just felt like all you people who are participating in this, don't you know you're just gonna get rewritten once you leave the company? But maybe they thought they'd be there for life. Please. So, just like in terms of trying to be honest, right? You don't want to have your own, oh, sorry. So you're trying not to impose your own opinion, right? right. And so you're following certain people. And so in console wars, you were following Tom Kalinske and telling the story of Sega. In this, you're following Palmer Lucky telling the story of Oculus. So how do you avoid not being their mouthpiece or not being biased in a way, right? If you were telling the story of, from, of Nintendo and met with their CEO for whatever, a few years, then how would you avoid them not being the protagonist and Sega being the antagonist, or in this case, maybe Facebook or, you know? No, that's a really important question. I don't know that there is a, a great answer, it's, but, it was, but it was something I thought about every day and definitely didn't want to be duped into being a mouthpiece for these people. I think that, I mean, for one thing, I talked about access being key, and in February of 2016, so a month before, the launch of Oculus's first headset, I was basically given unlimited access to speak with any employees at Facebook and Oculus. So I was able to speak with Palmer, but I also, in the, in the end, I spoke with probably about 200 people, but at least safely I've said over 100. Um, and I think that, you know, that is one guardrail to make sure that I'm talking to a lot of different people. Um, and that doesn't you know, guarantee that you're gonna hear all the dirt about these people, but, but it does guarantee that you're gonna get 200 different perspectives, and, and in that usually you'll hear some negative things and start to see things in a different light. Um, and part of it too is I think that because it is often from the perspective of Tom Kalinske, it's very explicitly or, or very blatantly from the perspective of Tom Kalinske or Palmer Lucky, you at least feel um, like, you, like it, what you know when it's their perspective and their thoughts versus me as the author saying like, it was the greatest thing ever. You know, it's kind of more known um, that it's from that perspective. I, I think the, I guess I, I'm less so worried about that and more so I tr worry about the sympathetic aspect. I was listening to podcasts on the way over and they're talking about the Sopranos and other antiheroes and how, you know, people rooted for Tony Soprano, even though we probably all agree he was a scumbag. Um, and so that, that's, that is why I don't think I would ever write a book not with an ensemble cast, um, I think that it's critical to see those people from other perspectives, which I guess happened in The Sopranos as well. But um, I at least, you know, I, I, I try to put in as many checks and balances as possible. Um, and, then, and then the last thing, and it was a real benefit of this book versus Console Wars, was I had access to, to so many archival documents, particularly emails um, from these people to their colleagues or to uh, customers and and as often as possible I tried to defer to that to actually include that um, and and more so than in console wars I tried to step out of the way you know I, one one benefit or not uh, there's a lot of benefits to having console wars out there I don't think I would have ever gotten the access um, to from Facebook and oculus had I didn't if I hadn't had a book that most a lot of the people there liked but I also, uh, one unexpected benefit was there was criticism after the first, after that book came out. You know, for the most part, it was well received and it was certainly successful, but there were plenty of people who thought it was the biggest piece of shit ever. And, um, you know, sometimes they had good points. Um, I, I don't think that there's that much I would change for that story, but, um, but, but, I, but I think that there was, um, like, more purplish prose in there, more of me editorializing, more of me um, not just explaining something for the reader, which I think is important, but more of me trying to, to nudge the reader to feel a certain way. Um, and, and I'm not sure if I regret that, but I did not want to do that here. Um, and so like this, I feel like this book is so much, much more sticks to, sticking to the facts um, and letting them speak for themselves. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, can you describe the journey from commodities trader to writer? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was life-changing. 
I mean, I think that the, the best thing I could say, and I mentioned it today in my tweet promoting the event, was that I'm wearing pants today, and this is like the first time I've worn pants in five years. And Jonah knows because he's seen me for many of those days during the five years. So um, that's because I think that pants are restricted to the creative process, but also um, <laughs> somewhat symbolic to be like, all right, now I'm doing what I want for a living. But yeah, um, I, I, out of college, I knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I had no idea how to monetize that. And uh, unfortunately, there's not really many paths you would go down as like becoming a lawyer or a doctor. Um, and but, but at least it did feel like there was some semblance of a path when it came to screenwriting and there was film school. And so my original plan had been to work at this commodities brokerage for a year. I was living with my grandma at the time um, in the city. My grandfather had recently passed away, so we were good roommates to one another. And I saved up a bunch of money and I was going to go to film school. And then this character, Jonah, and I decided to make a movie uh, about competitive rock, paper, scissors and put all of our money <laughs> that we had then and had, would have for like the next five years into it, which is a debatable decision in retrospect. <laughs> we learned a lot, so that was good. But, uh, but you know, um, I still had, I ended up keeping my day job for eight years and for a lot of those years I would work, you know, one of the benefits of trading commodities was that the market opened very early and I, it would close at 2.15 and then a lot of times I would go over to Jonah's and we would work on our scripts and Again, unfortunately, um, you know, throughout our entire 20s, we never sold anything. We were successful, you know, we were successful, quote unquote, because we at least got good representation out of it. Um, but, you know, it didn't feel, it didn't feel very successful. Um, and then eventually, uh, actually, Jonah and I wrote a script that's probably the best script we've ever written um, called The Sordid Tales of an Evil Tyrannical Ex-Dictator. Um, about a Ricky Gervais sort of uh, European dictator who gets overthrown and goes on the run or moves to the US, works at the DMV in sort of a witness relocation program and then his life catches up with him. And anyway, it, it was a very good script. It was the one that we thought was gonna break us through and, and finally get us a payday. And then about a week after we finished it, we found out that, or you know, it was publicly announced that Sasha Baron Cohen was doing a movie called The Dictator, and at that point he had written no script. Um, all he had really done was put out this idea, and instantly our project became worthless. And and sort of realizing like that that's understandable. Like why would anybody want to take a chance on the two of us in an unknown project when you could have a bankable star like him who had done a great show? Um, and and I think that, that was a real wake up call for both of us. Um, just that, that that could always happen. Um, you know, to our next script and whatever we do. And so, um, at least I know that my big takeaway after feeling depressed for a long time was to only work on things that I absolutely love and assume that potentially other people are working on it too. So, um, to try to, to tell it in the way that felt like my voice and also to make sure that even if nothing comes of this project, that at least it's a good, enjoyable experience. And then I guess as often seems to happen uh, as, as I interview people about how they became successful often in the creative arts is that like the one project I set out to do with no intention of making money on, which was console wars. And I was just like, I'm curious about this story. I want to find out ended up being what led to um, some success. And, and the way that it did lead to success was um, I had started to research Sega and Nintendo. I went to the Barnes and Noble on 86th street, originally looking to buy a book that was console wars, like a behind the scenes look at that battle, or even just a behind the scenes look at, video game history and the business of it. And I was shocked that there was not a single book in the entire store. Um, and it, was, you know, it wasn't at that moment that I left there thinking like, aha, I'm gonna fill this demand that I perceive to be out there. But, it, but I was thinking about it a lot. And it was around the time I talked to Jonah and told him what I was working on. And, and he suggested we do a documentary, uh, which was a great suggestion and something that we've ended up moving forward with. And um, I moved forward with doing this book and then as, as you know, one of the nice things about doing both of these books is that they're ultimately, to me, just like great character-driven human drama case studies, but they are case studies in a way. They're both successful business stories. And you know, you spending all this time speaking with these people and thinking about it, you learn things from um, the success of these companies. And with Sega, one of their um, things that they did that was very clever was they aligned themselves with young celebrities that they could afford, uh, often, people from like the Saved by the Bell sort of gang or uh, Blossom crew. Um, and, and so uh, John and I Googled celebrity gamers, like that was literally what we did. And Seth Rogen came up on the list and um, 
we, we, I asked our manager if he could send the treatment that I had written over to Seth and his business partner, Evan Goldberg. Absolutely did not think anything was going to come from that. Um, it was just a total shot in the dark, but from Sega and you know, I sort of learned that that's what you got to do. Uh, just take a bunch of shots and maybe some of them work out. And then miraculously, Seth wanted to meet with us and we met with them in January of 2012, January 2012. And it was the first time, like it was, not only was it, you know, meeting with a celebrity and someone who ended up changing our careers, but it was the first time that we ever met with a decision maker. Like we'd always met with all these creative execs that, we're like, all right, it sounds good. And then nothing comes from it or, you know, our people will contact their people. Um, and so I remember we were happy. That was a Thursday and felt like our lives were about to change. And they eventually did. But that Monday I was back trading commodities and was like, what, what happened? I thought my life was supposed to change. Um, and then we ended up, um, that was in January. It took most of that year to figure out what exactly Seth and Evan's role was going to be in this project. They were, him and Seth and Evan went off to direct their first movie, uh, which ended up being called This Is The End, but it, uh, what was it called back then? Do you remember? It's like something apocalypse or, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, uh, we wanted our lives to change overnight, but it, but it was a slow burn um, that was really set into motion by them meeting up with Scott Rudin and Scott saying uh, he wanted to work on a video game project with them and them saying, oh, we're actually already working on this project with these two guys. And Scott being like, wow, no one's ever done this. Um, and, 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 you know, I could tell this story for hours because it really is a story of how my life changed and how I got to do what I want every day. But the one notable takeaway that, that really strikes me and, and might seem somewhat surprising is just that even you know, after that whole year, after we got Scott Rudin, who's the producer behind Social Network and um, Moneyball and some of the, and all the Wes Anderson movies and some of the greatest movies, and we had Seth Rogen, who's a movie star, who agreed to write the forward to the book and was going to be making a dramatization movie and doing our documentary, even with all this great talent and me, who no one knew, but like, we, I, uh, we sent the book proposal out to 25 different publishers and 22 of them passed because they said video game books don't sell. And I was thinking like, yeah, that's because there's like, nobody's trying to sell them. And this, that was the whole point. Um, and so I've, I was always really glad that the book was successful. Well, obviously I was like, for a lot of reasons, but, but at least it helped. I know it has helped other writers who have done video game books since um, have a little bit more of a, a foot in the door. And, and also if any of you out there are young, writers covering video games, looking to write a book, I always make myself available to speak with them because I'd like to see more books in that area. And I also know that I wish I had someone who, with some expertise when I was writing it. Hey, thank you for coming. So uh, how about updating us on the reaction from Facebook and the other characters? Uh, of the oh, yeah. That's been uh, wonderful. No, uh, so, so one part of the story that I didn't really get into was that there, so, so Palmer Lucky was, was fired, though Facebook never even said as much. Publicly, they said that he exited the company. And I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, I've never seen that before for an executive where, where the news article doesn't say they resign or it doesn't say that they were fired, it just says that they exited. And I later learned that the reason for that is because they wanted, the, you know, it was their decision to move on from him. But in those typical situations, the person who's being fired usually reaches some agreement where they, they, you know, they resign, so they save face, and it's a whole thing. But Palmer has a scorched earth mentality, which was great for a writer, but also not great for Facebook. And, and he, um, they thought that their, agreement, their exit agreement with him entailed him writing some re resignation letter, but that was not part of the agreement. And he said, at that point, he had gotten into a tr he felt he had gotten into enough trouble by following their suggestions and decided not to write anything. So there was always this murky aspect to his departure, um, and and uh, you know this potential connection to politics because you know ever since the story broke that he was a Trump supporter, he was basically not allowed back in the office. Um, and, and so flash forward a year, I still had this ongoing relationship with Facebook. And for the most part, most of the book is very flattering or um, inspiring about the, the adventures of these entrepreneurs at Oculus and their acquisition by Facebook and Facebook's vision. Um, so it was a generally 
positive relationship um, until it got to the area of, of Palmer Lucky and his departure. And I remember, um, and, and, I, and I was pretty upfront with them saying like, that I, in, in one recording I was listening to the other day, I said, I explicitly said, you know, my biggest concern with this book is Palmer's exit. Um, he, he's a main character, I can't just have him like, you know, be like, and then Palmer was gone. And then, you know, like readers deserve more than that. We all deserve more than that. Um, and, and I also worried that it would make the people there look bad, uh, particularly his, his, his co-founders, because they were, they always referred to each other as like brothers and, and anyone who's been in a small business or close, you know, small knit group, you could sort of imagine like that familial aspect to it. And so you have these guys who are talk about him as if he's their brother and then he's, he's no longer with the company and he very much did not want that to be the case. He wanted to be there for the rest of his life um, because it was his company and also he was, he was the face of the company for the early years and, and very much the face of virtual reality. So anyway, I, I really started pushing on what had happened with Palmer and his exit. And then I guess it's, I assume at some point, uh, Facebook realized that they were going to have to provide me with some sort of um, deeper answer. And so they did something that I think that they do a lot where they, they won't officially say anything, but they'll, they'll talk to reporters on background or off the record. Um, which, you know, either which means that you can't attribute it to them as a source or that you can't report on it. Um, but often that's the case when people talk about sensitive matters and it's like, you know, we'll at least give you the truth. But what they gave me was um, a lot of lies, including the fact that they, they, the version of, of events that they told me uh, included him, him choosing to leave the company, which, which to me, I was like, that's a very bold lie because I, I don't think that they realized that I had been in contact with him during his entire six month exile period. Um, and there were a lot of things that he couldn't talk to me about during that time. But a lot of times, you know, I also spent time with him one on one. And, and if someone, you know, if, even if he couldn't answer things just from facial reactions and his, his, the way he didn't, you know, he couldn't answer things. You, you learn a lot, or at least you feel like you uh, perceive the experience. Anyway, so, so Facebook ended up um, lying to me through a lot of different executives. Um, and, and I also, as, as I started to become suspect of the narrative that they were telling me, particularly when they went so far as to say that Palmer chose to leave, um, I also started to realize or, or suspect that because of my writing style, because it is um, narrative nonfiction and it is, does not attribute the information to specific sources, it, you know, it just it reports what I believe are the facts as long as I'm able to get the information and, and confirm it. Um, and so they had multiple people telling me the same thing. So I'm getting the information, they're confirming it, they're confirming it again, I'm hearing it from multiple sources. And I felt like they were trying to launder this misinformation through me because Palmer, was legally gagged from speaking to me, so he couldn't confirm or deny anything. And they were telling me something that sounded, you know, interesting or at least aligned enough. Um, and, and then actually, um, I feel like it's a nice poetic justice that their lying to me is ultimately what led to the truth coming out um, because there were a lot of um, employees at, at Oculus and even at Facebook that didn't like how things happened with Palmer um, a lot of people like me who don't share his politics, but just felt like that, that's, that is unfair to hold someone's politics against them, or that's, that's what they felt. And, uh, and they wanted the truth out there. And when I started speaking with them and sharing with them what I had been told, or even a draft of like, here's what it's going to be like if no one's actually telling me the truth, um, though I never really intended to publish that, because I sort of, at that point, suspected it was not true, that really inspired a lot of people to leak more documents to me and to try to make sure that I got what they thought was the full story. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, Facebook is not, uh, is not happy and supportive of the book. Um, and, and how do I know that? I know that because over the past few months, a bunch of employees have been posting, you know, like exciting things or just musing things about the book. And I know what management is telling them and I know what management is telling them because those people trust me than they, more than they trust the company because they feel like they, are being lied to. Um, and so, um, like, then publicly, you know, so, so I know that internally they're saying certain things, and then I know that they, uh, I made it clear to them that I knew what they were saying about me, and fortunately they've sort of backed off that a little bit, but, but publicly the only thing that they've actually said is that not everything in the book is true. Um, and, you know, 
well, one, I, I believe it was all true. Um, and I've yet to be informed of things that aren't, but, but I'm sure that there are um, inaccuracies that I'll be embarrassed to have made small, hopefully immaterial things, but um, uh, you know, any, uh, any, uh, any inaccuracies in there, I will make sure to correct, but it's, it's really, it's sort of this playbook that Facebook has followed with every negative story again about them over the past year, where a story comes out in the New York Times and it's a 20 page story, or at least when I print it out, and they just say, that's not true. And they don't say what's not true. They don't really feel any responsibility to uh, answer for any of it. And I guess that's fair, because it's like, no one's really gonna force them to do it unless they're under oath in, um, in a legal proceeding. So I guess it, that's worked for them thus far. But I felt like it was a badge of honor to finally get my like, oh, not everything's true from them. Um, yeah. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Oh, I, the one of the things um, that I that I find amusing is, and that, uh, I think you'll find amusing is, to me, to me, um, th almost three years ago today, three years, February eighteenth, twenty sixteen. That was the first time that I was on campus um, at Facebook and and interviewing employees. And one of my interviews was with Brendan Reeb, who was the CEO and really the guy who made Oculus happen, um, even in, by Palmer's own admission, more so than he did. Um, and, and Brendan, I remember being outside of his office and him saying like, what do you think this book's gonna be? And I said like, well, you know, at this point I was thinking more of like the Mad Men thing, like I wanted to focus on one company and now that I was getting this access, I said, you know, the way I'm seeing it, it's very early, I see it as sort of this marriage between you and Palmer. Um, and you was more like you plural, meeting him and his buddies that he'd been at a bunch of different startups with. Um, and so, I, and, and I do think that that's kind of how the book ended up shaping, that it's the story of um, this eccentric kid who begins the book living in a 19-foot camper trailer, tinkering with headsets, and has no experience in business, and really is just more of a dreamer than anyone who could practically start a business. And then you have this guy, Brendan, who's, who started a few businesses that sold, and and sees an opportunity here and loves technology and is uniquely talented as a former programmer turned entrepreneur to actually be able to talk tech speak to the engineers and talk um, investor speak to VCs. And, um, and so I think that their relationship is incredibly fascinating and it's mutually beneficial um, throughout most of the story. Hi, another question. Hello. <laughs> uh, in comparison to Console Wars, because that book is, uh, you're, you're interviewing people and you're hearing stories that took place 20, 30 years ago. Uh, how different was the work for this book where things are a little more recent, people's memories are a little, maybe a little more vivid and clearer? Was there any difference between that and Console Wars? There's absolutely a difference, um, primarily in two areas that inform each other. One was that, like I said earlier, I was, had, I was the beneficiary of a, a lot of feedback and criticism to console wars, and the the thing that people criticized most when they criticized it was the the dialogue and the recreated scenes, and that was a decision I made with the book that I would make again um, because there were so few artifacts from that time that I wanted to bring it to life and didn't have the materials, but at least had the people um, there to help me do so. And so, if they remembered, it was a conversation about what they had for dinner, but they didn't remember exactly what they said, I felt like I could responsibly report that or present it, um, provided that I was, had their input and spoke to those involved in the conversation. But, but it was a criticism and one that I f um, thought I could do better with this time. And also one that, because of the second most important thing was I just had access to, to so many emails. Um, part of that was just because there was this legal case against Oculus and there was thousands of, um, court documents, um, and, then, and then, as I mentioned earlier, after people started to grow suspicious of Facebook or not like how they handled things, they were very helpful to me in getting me a bunch of emails and stuff like that. And so, um, it, you know, a lot of times where maybe I'd have the conversation about like, oh, what should we have for dinner? I actually had an email of them saying like, what should we have for dinner? And that's clearly a, not a very interesting example, but at least in most cases, I felt like I can just include verbatim what they actually said. And, and, that's a, and that was a gift as well because um, you know, it's not a shock to say that people don't always remember things accurately, especially when it doesn't make them look good. Um, so having that as a check on them um, was really helpful. 
um, especially for people who didn't know that I had that information so I could see whether they were trying to mislead me or at least uh, you know, take a guess if they were trying to or not. Maybe they were just misremembering things. But um, I do think that the, the style, I, I hope that the book reads really accessibly and so far I've been really excited and encouraged to see that a lot of people have like already read through the first 15 chapters in a few hours and, and are blowing through it. And that's, you know, my, my grandma can, that means my grandma could probably read it. Um, but I wanted to make sure that there was, um, that the, most of the interactions were based on as much archival and, and hard evidence as possible. And, and I also had a rule for myself with this book that I definitely didn't have for Council Wars by design, which was that I, I didn't report anything uh, or I didn't, you know, because of the narrative nonfiction, I think of a lot of these chapters as scenes or various scenes. You know, I didn't write any scenes that were, that I couldn't give the exact date on. Um, whereas in Council Wars, sometimes it was like a combination of several different conversations um, put into one conversation or um, I had to just really rely on people's guess as to when something happened. But for here, I, there were a few scenes I wrote that I thought were pretty great and would, should be in the book, but I didn't want to put them in because I couldn't say this was the exact date it happened. So. Uh, I'm curious how people, if, if people see much of a difference, um, but I certainly tried to improve upon certain things um, because the story was much more recent. And also because of how the book ends, I felt that there was much more at stake here. Facebook is a publicly traded company, which I guess say and Nintendo are trade as well. But, um, you know, I think fa a lot of people are looking into Facebook now, and that's a good thing. I think Facebook itself does a lot of good things as a company. I don't think they're an evil corporation. I also think they've been sort of treated unfairly by the media in some cases, but, but given their, their scale and, and the position that they have um, in, the, in our digital lives, I think it was really important to be completely accurate so that when Facebook says not everything is accurate, I can at least say to them, well, I think it is, and not say, well, yeah, I guess you're right. There's some things that aren't accurate. So that, that was really important to me. Um, so that people will hopefully um, accept and be as surprised by some of the revelations I found. How are we on time? Any last question? What's next for me? That's an awesome question. I really want to just like sleep for two weeks. <laughs> right, Katie? That's okay. Um, I don't know. I think that that is a really good question because I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Um, I th um, one, one personally interesting takeaway to me from doing this whole process, especially again, a book that was supposed to be done two years ago, was that um, most of the authors that I really like and have informed my style and um, who I you know, would hope in some way my career would be modeled after theirs or emulate some of their success, like, like Michael Lewis or Ben Mesrick and, and some of these other great nonfiction writers, you know, they tend to put out a book every year or two. And I've realized that I'm probably not going to be someone who does that, that it takes me much longer um, to tell these stories and that I like to do a lot more uh, researching and interviewing, and not to say that they don't do a good job with that, but I like to tell more of a global story um, involving hundreds of interviews where they typically interview more of a small group of people and then tell that story. Um, that said, the, I, I would like, really like to move forward with the project that I was originally going to do next um, after Console Wars, which is the story of the first three Americans to open a hotel in Tahiti, uh, which I remember being pitched to me by my manager with the, uh, basically he said, I was burnt out from Council Wars and he said, how would you like to go to Tahiti and only interview like two people, two of the three remaining uh, still, uh, still alive people? Um, and I was like, that would be so much better than interviewing so many people and dealing with angry people. And, um, and so I would definitely like to do that. And as, as some of you might know, Council Wars um, is being turned into a television series by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and Jonah and I are executive producers on that, and so that that is in motion. And um, and and even though I haven't actually started really the sec this book about Tahiti, or certainly have not sold it, um, that is going to be a television series as well, um, directed by David Gordon Green, um, who who some people might know from um, his involvement in 
what is he most well known for? Like Eastbound and Down? Yeah, Pineapple Express. He's a, he does a great job with like comedy and drama and I felt like that was a good tone and again, and someone who's way more famous than me. Um, so they basically need like the source material to base the show on. Um, and so I definitely want to do that, um, but we'll see. Do you have any ideas? All right, thank you. What about you? You, you organized this event. Let's have a round of applause. Yeah. I was like, I got an email to my info at Blake J. Harris account that I never checked because I always get uh, emails from this guy who stalks Palmer Lucky who started stalking me and, <laughs> and, and he's this uh, w white supremacist guy who if this is being recorded, if this is put out there in any way, he's almost definitely going to watch because I noticed that I did a podcast of, a month ago, an hour long podcast, and he wrote one of his crazy emails and he was citing from various points in the podcast, so we clearly listened to all of it. So he's a big fan who hates me and wants me to die because um, I'm Jewish and he always CCs that guy Weave who's like involved with the Daily Stormer, one of those terrible sites. Um, so anyway, hi Bill Wallace, thank you. Um, but anyway, so I don't check that account all that much, but I did check it a month or so ago and was so delighted to get an email from you that you were a fan of Council Wars, that you were interested in doing an event because this bookstore is where I bought like all, so many of the formative books in my life. Some of those Michael Lewis books like Moneyball and Blindsided and Jonathan Safran Foer books and Dave Eggers books and those guys who probably contributed to the purple prose aspect of Council Wars. So um, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Ah, okay.